Welcome to Ashe, a celebration of who we are and whose we are. I'm your host, Catholic evangelist Richard Lane, and I'd like to say welcome. Enjoy our show. If you'd like more information, please go to the website richardlaneministries.com. That's richardlaneministries.com. Enjoy. Welcome to our session today. It is truly an honor and a blessing for me to be able to introduce a young man that, uh, that knew me as a boy, and I never really knew him until I first came back to Detroit to preach uh, many years ago. And he looked at me and he says, uh, I know you, you're Night Train's boy. <laughs> and uh, it was truly an honor and a blessing to meet our next guest. He's the pastor of Sacred Heart Catholic Church as well as St. Elizabeth. He was born in Highland Park, Michigan, graduated from Detroit Sacred Heart Seminary High School and College, as well as St. John's Theological Seminary in Plymouth, Michigan. Our guest received his master's degree in social work at Wayne State University in 1965. Mm -hmm. And Father Norm P. Thomas was ordained a Catholic priest in 1955. He has served as associate pastor in Wyandotte, Pontiac, as well as Hazel Park. In 1965, he became the director of the Urban Parish Apostolate, which coordinated efforts of the central city parishes here in the Archdiocese of Detroit in the city of Detroit. Norm Thomas' main, main concern since 1968 is being pastor of Sacred Heart Catholic Church in Detroit where he lives and works. In the year 2007, he was appointed pastor of St. Elizabeth Catholic Church as well. Now get this, Father Thomas is chairperson of the Eastern Market Task Force. He is vice chairperson of the Detroit Catholic Pastoral Alliance. He is chairperson of the Urbish Urban Parish Coalition. He is member of the Interfaith Committee for Workers' Issues, board member of Wayne County Catholic Social Services, board member of Sacred Heart St. Elizabeth and Shane Providence Community Development Corporations, chairperson of the Sweat Free World Campaign, and in 2005, the Urban League gave him the Distinguished Warrior Award. I want to welcome to Ashe my brother in Christ, Father Norm P. Thomas. Thank you. How are you? Good. Sounded like an obituary. You said it's, it's it's your job title. You must be tired after all those things, man. You know, let, let's jump right into it. I know a lot of priests around around the country, and I know some that have retired at seventy two, seventy five. But and I remember talking to you years ago, and I asked you when are you going to retire. You said not until they put me in the ground. <laughs> What keeps you going, Father Norm? Well, I think it's the people. It's the people. Um, people that I get to know. People get to know me, and uh, that's what keeps me going. Amen. Uh, and what uh, what I decided to uh, become a priest, and that's my work. That's my life. So they keep raising the retirement age for me. It's up, I think it's up to 95. So. so you got six more years before you can retire. <laughs> five more years, five more years. <laughs> then they'll raise it again, but so that's all right. That's good. What are some of the, what are some of the changes, and, and we're doing this in celebration of Black Catholic History Month in November, as well as Black History Month in February, what are some of the changes that you have seen in uh, since you have been a priest for black Catholics in the Archdiocese of Detroit? I think, um, you know, going back, uh, black Catholics were uh, almost an anomaly. I mean, uh, a lot of people knew that there were uh, black people. <laughs> Detroit, but Catholic, mm -hmm. and um, 
I, I remember when I came to Sacred Heart, I mean, people who knew me didn't know Sacred Heart, say, do you have many, do you have any parishioners? <laughs> There's black Catholics going way back to, as far as I know in history, Detroit in 1911. Okay. When um, they met at uh, St. Mary's School. Okay. And faced that uh, segregation. St. Mary's is a beautiful church, but they weren't allowed in church. So, through the efforts of the diocese, the bishop um, found a building that uh, was an Episcopal church down the street. Elliot and Bobian became St. Peter Claver, mm. 1914. And um, it was a great parish. Uh, People excited about their faith and having a place to worship. <clears throat> Even rented a few uh, rooms in the apartments and started a school. Okay. Amazing. Um, they were there till 1938 when um, the uh, diocese decided they should move to Sacred Heart. Sacred Heart had a German Catholic population. Going back to 1875, the building we're in was built in 1875. And uh, there's, uh, September 1st, 1938, they marched up the street, up Elliott Street, and uh, took over Sacred Heart, which had a school, big, bigger school. Right. And um, it became the um, it became the place where people who came from uh, the South or came to Detroit, right? Catholics, where they would come and go to school, worship. It was highly segregated. Catholic church. Really? People who lived next to a Catholic church or the school were not welcome in that school. And uh, <laughs> I'm telling you, the uh, the strong faith, oh boy, uh, proud of being Catholic, certainly proud of being black, and that was a given. Yes. Uh, but uh, uh, just, uh, it was amazing to hear these stories that I heard in the beginning. When I, this was 1968 when I came here. Um, people be, being uh, told at communion time that your parish is Sacred Heart, so that you know you wouldn't, you're not, you're not to return here uh, to this wow. Catholic Church, the White Catholic Church. But people kept the faith. It's amazing. Kept the what faith. do you think kept people faith? What I mean, I just in 2020, as a as an African American Catholic, right now, I hmm. could not imagine. Uh, continuing to serve a church that would literally tell me, no, you cannot yeah, receive the yeah, Eucharist yeah. because of the color of my skin. What do you think was the, uh, was the core of the people's faith at that particular time? Well, it was, a, it was a, their faith wasn't in, in, in people or in the priests of those parishes that, right. that, that treated them that way. Um, their faith was in God, you know, and a, and a deep, deep attachment to Jesus Christ. Uh, it was uh, very evident in the way people sang, the way people prayed. I mean, I remember <laughs> uh, some years ago, an NCR reporter was doing a story, and I think we did a story a little bit about Sacred Heart. He says, well, you don't have a school anymore. So why should people come to this parish? Wow. I just they come to pray. And I mean, it ended the conversation. <laughs> he, he, he never thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> come to pray. <laughs> you know? yeah. So um, we had a school. And by the time I got here, it was closed. But it did a great job. Um, People love the school. As a matter of fact, there's still an alumni 
of Sacred Heart School. Really? Very active. It's a, it's a group in the parish. That's Very, awesome. Yeah. You know, it's kind of terminal because there's no new students. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that said, our relationships, I mean, my relationship with the people, uh, I learned a lot. Oh, right. I learned a lot. How did the Archdiocese, how did your formation prepare you? We, we understand how the formation prepared you for ministry. Yeah. But let's be real. Did they prepare you for ministry for African Americans, for black Catholic black, oh, no. black Catholics? No, no, they didn't prepare because they didn't know what it was. Right. Um, and uh, to this day, really don't prepare uh, pastors uh, to serve in the city, or uh, uh, they, they do a good job with the uh, Latino community. Yes. They, um, they, some, uh, some priests are immersed in uh, the culture, the language, go to Mexico, yes. uh, are trained there and come back and certainly are very familiar uh, with uh, the uh, Latino community, the parishes that are here. I asked one time why they, why we didn't do that, in that immersion for African American uh, community and the immersion yes. of priests. Yes. And they, I think the answer I got was the, our, our seminarians uh, serve at the soup kitchen. Wow. I said, well, that's the problem. <laughs> you always see black people as objects of your mission right. rather than subjects. Subject. So, um, yeah, well, it, I wasn't. I wasn't trained. You know, who, who trained me was the people, and uh, I was willing to be trained. <laughs> Amen. When you, you know, when you're ordained, you think you know everything, but <laughs> you know, but it takes about ten minutes to find out you don't know, <laughs> you don't know a lot. Of things. And I'm sure the mother of the church will let you know that. <laughs> you know, that's one thing about the black Catholic experience is we love Jesus. We love our church. And most importantly, we love our pastors. Oh, yeah. yeah. We love our pastors. And I think that's one of the main things that we do when we get a new pastor, a new priest, is we want to let them know that you're my pastor. Yeah. We love you. You, yeah. we're here to yeah. serve you. Yeah, you're my priest. This is yes, my, this is my priest. Yeah. Well, it's. Uh, I think it's everything about our our faith and religion is really about relationships. And yes. what you're saying is so true. I, I find that uh, deep faith in God and loyal uh, want to really follow Jesus. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, it's a struggle. That's the, that road is rough. Yes, yes. And the going is tough, but uh, I, I see great people. I want to take you back for a moment, Father Norm, and I want to read this statement to you. This is why we have the black Christ. This is why we have hope. We hope to shock people out of their ignorance of Christ. We hope to teach them whose pain this is in this city and country of ours. If any man walk into our church and say, my God, Christ is black. If he can take the next step and say black poverty is Christ's, black frustration is Christ's. We will have done what we have hoped to do. These words were said by Father Raymond Ellis in 1968. Oh, yeah, my countrymen. Really? Uh, yeah, we're both Lebanese. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. What do you, when you, when you hear what he said, black poverty is Christ, black frustration is Christ. And he said these words when they christened that, uh, that picture of the black Jesus. Yeah. 
above the altar at St. Cecilia, now St. Charles Luanga, yeah. there was so much controversy and visceral uh, hatred, if, if you will, of a black Christ. Uh, when you hear black poverty is Christ, black frustration is Christ, what do you, what do you think about? Well, I remember um, we had a meeting of priests, and Father Ellis was one of them, a city priest. Yes. And uh, we, were, we were all trying to learn and uh, kind of fumbling around. And it was at the time that uh, Stoker Carmichael, black power. Yes. And we talked about that, and we said, you know, this is, this is something real, black power. This is not just a little slogan. It's like black lives matter. It's not just a slogan. It's, it's, it, it has a deep meaning. Black power. <laughs> Father Ellis said, you guys are crazy. <laughs> you guys are crazy. This, 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 that, that, that's, not, that's not on our Catholic, uh, uh, that's not our Catholic thing. Ray Ellis was a great guy. He was a man. Um, he went home. And the next week, the Beacon, which was the parish paper, had a headline, Black Power Comes to Cecilia-Ville. Wow. <laughs> I mean, he, and he took it, and so the words he says, I mean, came from a deep uh, uh, meditation and, and, and thinking about what was going on. And he could, he could do that. He could, uh, then he could formulate the, the words, powerful words, uh, black power. You know, there was a time, and I'm, 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 I'm still a young kid. I was born in 1965. I'm only 55 years old, but I remember growing up in the 70s, you hear black power. I'm black and I'm proud. You hear all of these wonderful sayings that were not just slogans, but they were what we believed. It was ingrained in the culture. Fast forward to 2020. Why is it so hard for non-blacks to say Black Lives Matter? Um, racism. I mean, it's uh, um, racism is part of the air we breathe. <clears throat> the air we breathe. I mean, um, um, people, you know, counter that with all lives matter. It's to take away what Black Lives Matter means. All lives matter if Black Lives Matter. You know, mm -hmm. it's got to happen. And, and uh, um, I, I, I just think that uh, you know that, that we have to uncover uh, what racism really means. It's a, it's a question of uh, superiority. But Father Norman makes people uncomfortable talking about that. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, you say white supremacy. Oh man, we're not at supremacy. That sounds like uh, Hitler, right? You know, or some, uh, to, but that's it. <laughs> it's a real thing. It's a real thing. Uh, like James Baldwin said, "He's been white too long. White too long. You know, kind of gave up hope that everything would ever change." Um, and I still, I kind of live in the shadow of hope that, you know, um, it's an uphill battle because it isn't just about, and you know that, it's not, it's not just about prejudice. That's bad. But it's a power thing. The power to, uh, to maintain this system. Um, and we see it all the time. Um, to maintain this system of where white superiority. And is it a fear of change? Yeah, I guess, uh, well, there's a, first of all, it's a fear because of the unknown. Because a lot of people, uh, white people don't know black people. Right. Um, and what they get is from the news or something like that. And uh, it's a, uh, it, it is a, uh, an effort to, for a deeper understanding. 
of who we are. And uh, to realize, too, uh, you know, that all people, all black people don't think alike. <laughs> it's uh, that, that comes to, you know, people have such stereotypes. Right. There is, a, you know, there is a person who does that stereotype, you know. I knew a, our, our music director years ago, Clarence Hightower, is an icon of, of music. Uh, and uh, he would not eat watermelon. I said, oh, watermelon is good. Uh, he said, I won't eat because it's a stereotype. Right. <laughs> I mean, right. so... Um, there's uh, uh, people, black people on uh, 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 black Catholics are like in, like, like anybody who's got different opinions um, and uh, uh, different uh, backgrounds, experiences, and uh, different convictions. But there's something about that I have discovered and I don't is there something that runs in all through blackness that uh, there's a there's an understanding of the, the of racism here in this country and so what well, doesn't matter whether you're a black Baptist or black uh, atheist or what um, because you're black you're gonna face a lot of opposition. Let's go back to 1967, mm. the riots here in Detroit, Michigan. Um, the riots, they say, started by, it was at a, uh, because of a celebration of two men that had just come back home from Vietnam and they were gathered at a local, there was a local gathering and, and something happened, the police came and things got out of hand and from what I understand, over 40 people were, were killed during a period of yeah. five days. Um, it was known as the riots of 67. We, there was an underlying issue that ignited that conflagration of, of hate, of, of hurt. And the underlying issues were similar to that of what it is today oppression of black people, systemic oppression of black people, socioeconomic challenges for black people, uh, a church that wouldn't really support them or look out for them, jobs, as well as police brutality as well. Those were all the underlying issues. Since 1967, since that, and then we also know, and, and I found out Focus Hope was actually born mm -hmm. a year later out of that. Mm -hmm. Cardinal Dearden uh, encouraged the, the priests of the diocese to do a special homily that Sunday, Focus uh, on Hope and Love. Where has the city of Detroit come in the 50 plus years since the riots? Have well, we really improved? Uh, well, there's we a lot of changes, a lot of, uh, I would say, uh, improvements. Uh, some of them came the hard way, though. Uh, the freeways, I love to drive on the freeway, you know. Mm -hmm. I go out of my way to get on the freeway, to get there faster. Right. But the freeways really uh, uh, cut through um, the city, and especially I-75 right here, where we are. <clears throat> I-75 just cut out that whole uh, 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 black life and uh, businesses and uh, uh, activity along Hastings Street. Mm -hmm. Just cut it right out. Right just eliminated it and uh, in the um, uh, it's covered of urban renewal well it wasn't a renewal for a lot of people it was a disruption it was right. an elimination of uh, uh, of a whole culture 
right here, Hastings, and probably other parts of Detroit that I'm, I'm not familiar with. So have we come a long way? Well, there's <laughs> so things you mentioned. So is this. So is this. And uh, the uh, the obvious murder of George Floyd was a was a trigger. You know, yes. wasn't the first time someone had been uh, suffered. You know, uh, police brutality. But it was so obvious, so obvious. Uh, pictures right there. Wow, it's amazing. Witnessing. Um, that triggered protests. What should the Catholic Church be doing uh, during these times, these times of civil unrest? What is, in your humble opinion, what is the res does the Catholic Church have a responsibility uh, to the communities, to these communities? Yeah, I think there's a, I think there's a feeling and a, um, a, a, an understanding that uh, we've done some bad things. <laughs> we haven't really been part of the championing of like civil rights and the whole movement of Martin Luther King, uh, except for some individuals. I was about to say, there have been some, some powerful Catholic priests. There was Sister Antona Ebo. And the, 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 some individuals who really stand out. And they stand out because the, the church itself was not part of that. Hmm. Uh, I mean, yourself as well. well I've never, I mean, never championed the the cause and or leading the cause or or joining the cause because why is that yeah? why do you think it's a that white is? church it's a white church um there's some great catholic uh, uh priests black priests and bishops uh but it's still dominated by white european of theology and um, tradition, mm. and so it, it's difficult. But I, but I think you know uh, there are some good things have happened, and um, the, there's a realization that uh, racism is a sin by the church, and we, uh, there's a there's a, we got to do something. We got to be part of this. We got to. We got to help people to understand that it's that it's wrong. Racism is wrong. Um, that this idea of superiority, you know, we've got to we've got. To. So there's there's some good things and good statements, and and I think a, a deep a conviction. But I think the one thing that is missing is the the realization that racism is systemic. It's structural. Yes. It's historical. Yes. And um, it has to. There has to be some deep changes. Um, the other day, a, a GM added a person to their board, a white person with a lot of resources. Well, where are they going to put some uh, African Americans on that board um, in in charge of things? don't see it. And the same with the Catholic Church. Um, there's a, we have to move to some structural change, systemic change, uh, cultural change. And um, I see that that should happen in, in the seminary, the training of future uh, <clears throat> Priests, leaders, and and, and uh, lay leaders. Mm -hmm. When was the first time you saw a a black priest in the Archdiocese of Detroit? First time. Uh, I'm trying to to go back. I know uh, you know Tyrone Robinson's been around a long time. Um, the uh, I'm trying to think of the first time. Uh, I. Um, I know some. I know of some. Mm -hmm. Norman Duquette. Yes, Norm, Norm, Father Norman Duquette was the first African American priest yeah. ordained in Detroit, let alone the the state yeah. of Michigan. Yeah, yeah, that was a tough time for you know for him as a 
Uh, what are some of the things that he went through that you know of? Well, I think the fact that he was black. You know, he was a priest, but he was black, so uh -huh. maybe he's not as, uh, maybe he isn't as well trained, but not as smart as the white priest. You know, wow. Those kind of things. But he did a good job and finally went to uh, Flint. I don't know what was behind all that, but it, um, it might have been racial. I, I probably wouldn't have said that. Uh, you know, it, you say that, it r reminds me of Father Augustus Tolton. Oh, boy. Uh, the first African-American priest ordained for the United States, not yeah. in. Yeah. He was ordained in Rome and sent back to Quincy, Illinois, and... Uh, just as you mentioned something about Father Norman Duquette, it reminded me of the story. There was something that happened in Quincy. Mm -hmm. Actually, I do know what it was. Father Augustus Colton was known as that nigger priest to those nigger Catholics. Yeah. And all of a sudden, there were whites that began to come and flock to his church and part of his congregation. Mm -hmm. And the church said, no, we don't want this. We don't want to have a black priest leading white Catholics. And so they shipped him to Chicago. Yeah. Uh, do you think there could have been a similarity there? Oh, I think so. He had, he had, a, he had a rough time um, in the uh, parishes. We did a great work. Uh, and there's a cause for his you know, eventual canonization. I mean, right, right. Uh, that's uh, that's how how uh, much he had to struggle and and to to maintain his faith. Yes, and the faith of the people that that came to his church. Yeah. Who was the? Uh, and again, I I'm a convert to the faith, and I'm just I was not raised Catholic here in Detroit, but we had a black archbishop here. In, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, a black auxiliary bishop here in Detroit. Right, Who was right, that? Right. Um, I'm trying. Yeah, I know. He passed away. Uh, Moses Anderson. Yes, yes, Bishop Anderson. Bishop Moses Anderson. He had a very strong. Um, Bishop and priest, you know, well known. Um, Monsignor Jim Robinson was a good friend. He was uh, became the uh, rector of the cathedral mm -hmm. and um, um, present day, you know, Father Ted Parker, yes, Tyrone, my Mike Kachuku from Nigeria, and, yes. Um, don't forget don't about the baby John priest. McKenzie. Yes, the baby priest, Father John just, McKenzie. Just ordained. I don't. I have never met John McKenzie, but it's great to have him it in is. the archdiocese. It is. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. It's. Uh, we've had some great. We've had some black priests. In 1967 or 68, right? Out, the, there was <clears throat> the ministers of service that was formed. Yeah right out of there and the need was for black catholic men or black catholic male faces on the altar uh in in the inner city parishes how important was that during that time and how important is it now oh that was uh deacon l mcneely um was um had a had an apostle that there at saint bernard's on the east side and that was his that was his desire to form uh, uh, trained men, black men, um, for leadership in the church, ministers. They weren't deacons, but they were people of importance within the liturgical part of the church, so that they would they would stand in the altar and people could stay, you know, some young boy could say, hey, he looks like me, you yes, know, yes. it's amazing, because they never saw anybody that looks like them, and and um, that group was formed right around 1968, I remember we, there was a meeting, I was at that meeting at Sacred Heart Seminary, that Al McNeely called and had uh, met, there were a couple of white men too that wanted to be part of that, but um, that was his desire, 
and form those ministers or servers. And that ministry, that ministry remains today. Yes. We, um, we had, uh, I asked Al one, ta one time, I said, Al, you know, we got some women that, cause, you know, women in the church really yes. make the church. Yes. Um, we got some women and they, they really, uh, see the minister's uh, service and they let them be, a, they'd like to be part of that. And Al said, oh, look, that's, uh, I, this is why I started this, right? because a <laughs> black male was often just overlooked. Right. I says, well, do you mind if we start that with the women? He says, you go ahead. Just do it. That's all. My blessing. <laughs> so we have women who are called ministers of faith, same as the ministers of service okay. here at uh, Sacred Heart and St. Elizabeth. Um, and uh, we have, we have, uh, we have uh, quite a few, I, I think it's probably about uh, over 150 ministers wow. who really uh, take seriously what their ministry is. And we form different ministries and people uh, in charge of those and uh, do things that are necessary in the uh, community. Yes. With the, the closing of churches, uh, Catholic churches and Catholic schools in the Archdiocese of Detroit for decades, uh, we've seen a, a decrease in the black Catholic attendance in, in church here in, in, the, in the, the urban area. What do we need to do in order to get more African Americans to come back to the Catholic Church? To become Catholic, as well as how do we reach out to our young, to our youth and young adults? Wow, you you set a big agenda there. <laughs> that's a, that's a, that's a long a lifelong agenda for the church. I'd say um, the 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 closing of uh, churches and schools, especially in the city, where you know, the bishops' uh, conference put out, I open wide our hearts, a beautiful statement against racism, um, called it a sin. It was a, that was a sin. It was a sin to, to close the Holy Ghost. It was a sin, I think. I mean, uh, maybe I'm being extreme, but uh, closing the East Catholic and uh, um, on the west side, uh, gosh, I see, <laughs> just the, uh, closing those high schools, uh -huh. uh, I think was, uh, was close to being sent <laughs> somebody. Maybe not a personal thing, a person knowing as we're doing is a sin, but uh, looking back, it uh, should never have happened. Uh, that in the closing of parishes, even the archdiocese admits that 30% of the people uh, don't go to any church after the, that parish. Some go to other churches, but at least 30% uh, stop going. So that's the, that's the downside of what you're talking about. The upside is that um, our, our parishes, especially black Catholics, where there's a number of black Catholics in the parish, very lively, very spirit filled. Yes. And um, the uh, I, I I think that uh, uh, people feel this is um, my church, um, and extend that they they bring their family members, bring their uh, friends, and I think that's. That's one thing that we have to encourage more is let your let your friends know about your church. Uh, maybe they don't have a church. We're not trying to steal people from other right. churches. Right. You know, if right. they're going to a, if they're going to a, a Second Baptist or well, you know, they don't, they don't come on. We aren't going to steal everybody from Hartford. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah see, you're doing you're doing well, so. 
So <laughs> yeah, we don't, we don't. But there's a lot of people who are kind of looking around for a church, and uh, some who uh, don't know uh, about it. Encourage them, bring them. Invite. And some people do that, and that's how a parish grows. Yes, I think the, there are two key things that bring people to church. Mm -hmm. And Sacred Heart here in Detroit knows those two things because you have them. Mm -hmm. It's number one is preaching, mm -hmm. and number two is singing. Yeah. If you have one of those two, people will come. If the preaching stinks, but the music is great, <laughs> they'll come. If yeah. the music stinks, but the preaching is good, don't go there because your preaching is excellent. Well, uh, they have, they have, you have the double hitter here. Well, we try to do that at St. Elizabeth and Sacred Heart. Um, a choir, no matter how big it is, is very important. Yes. And it's not because it's a concert. It's not because of, uh, but it's, um, it's music uh, that is a prayer, prayerful, and it touches the heart. It's music got to touch you. I mean, music got to touch you, whether it's uh, sacred music, whether, whatever it is. It, it, and if it doesn't touch you, then it's just a lot of, Melody and Always. words, but uh, the music has to touch you. And uh, their songs and the, the, the way that people sing songs that touches people. Yes. It's got to touch. And uh, I remember there's a, a song that I would call a white song, <laughs> a white people song. And we had a lady one time that took that song. And I'm telling you, you talk about gospelizing. <laughs> I mean, she turned that, she turned that white song into something that was very, very special. Amen. And it touched people's hearts. You know, black people could turn the Star Spangled Banner into, <laughs> into an entire album. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Father Norm, you know, it's, it's been great talking to you in coming back to full circle. And I mean this as, as a compliment. And on December, I believe December 18th, you'll be 90 years old. Yeah. Um, 90 years young. In 15, 20 years from now, when the Lord brings you home, I'm not trying to send you home anytime soon. We need you, bro. But in 15, 20 years from now, when the Lord calls you home, how do you want, and, and, and please, you are, you have established a legacy here in the arch. Yes, you have. You have established a legacy here in Detroit. You have done what so many other priests have not done and would not do, do and that's basically reach out to a community who has suffered. You have been Christ to the downtrodden, to those who have suffered injustices. How would you like your legacy to be remembered when it's all said and done? Well, I don't know, but uh, you're saying some very nice things. I'm saying the truth, Father. I appreciate that. I mean, it's uh, we we just... Uh, um, I would like to see some real uh, structural change and cultural change in the Catholic Church. That's going to come at a price uh, by those in charge, those who have the power to make change. Because um, uh, Frederick Douglass says, you know, nobody just gives it up. Right. Uh, Something got to be—it's got to be taken in a way. So, hopefully, there'd be a a sharing of power or people, uh, black Catholics within the Catholic Church, are, are in positions as subjects and not just objects of mission. Uh, that the uh, black priests and uh, 
black bishops, um, black pastors who have power to make change. But those changes will be made in the system. The seminary becomes a place where uh, uh, black culture, that, that takes in a lot of things, you know, takes in theology. Yes. Black theology. I'm talking about black theology, which is kind of, you know, it doesn't count. Um, black arts, music, life, uh, where that is not just, uh, you know, welcomed as part of the, uh, well, you know, we welcome you. But it is the church. It is the church. And that, that would be appreciated. Well, Father Norm, on behalf of the church here in the Archdiocese of Detroit, on behalf of the tens of thousands of lives and souls that you have touched over the many decades that you have given your life, and I'm not trying to... I want to give you your, your flowers while you're here. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your priesthood. Thank you for your dedication to a people that have been on a journey for 400 plus years. Thank you for believing in us. Thank you for seeing Christ in us. But most importantly, Father Norm, thank you for being Christ to us. Well, I got this. I got a thank you for uh, to the people who uh, kind of put up with you at times sometimes uh, thank people for their love and their uh, devotion and uh, it's it's been it's been a great ride and it's not over no it's not i'm still no, standing not. i know i know <laughs> still standing as long as you're still standing the devil is still cussing to that, shout that's it <laughs> So I appreciate what you're saying, but I, I just feel it's the, it's the people we together. We're really, uh, if anything good happens, it's because we've done it together. Amen, amen. Father Norm Thomas, pastor of Sacred Heart Catholic Church, St. Elizabeth, thank you so much for your time, and uh, know that you will continue to be in my prayers, brother. Thank you very much. All right, God bless. <laughs> This program is brought to you in part by the Archdiocese of Detroit, sharing the gospel according to Jesus Christ since 1833. I also like to thank not only the Archdiocese of Detroit, but the Office of Multicultural Ministries for the Archdiocese of Detroit. God bless you.